live. Hey, everybody. On with a show here and going to talk about a bit of news that um, hit the NFL today via a report that the league is considering for the upcoming owners meeting next week, which will be a virtual owners meeting because they're not going to meet anywhere, be all online in some kind of way. Um, they're considering an adjustment to the rule that will allow involve draft picks uh, and a reward for those organizations that uh, bring on black coaches. And as I understand it, it basically uh, um, was worded like this, and uh, it will consist of a number of incentives. And basically, according to uh, a number of sources, well, primarily according to really uh, uh, Jim Trotter, uh, the league is going to present a number of resolutions at the virtual meeting. Um, and Jim Trotter is a longtime NFL uh, columnist and writer. Anyway, Trotter writes this. During his State of the League address three months ago at Super Bowl uh, uh, 54 in Miami, uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell acknowledged the need to increase the opportunities for minorities to become head coaches and general managers. Quote, clearly we are not where we want to be on this level, he said. It's clear we need to change. We have already begun discussing those changes, what stages we can take next to determine better outcomes. The call to action grew even louder after only one of, of the five coaching vacancies during the offseason was filled by a person of color, continuing a trend in which just three of the past 20 openings have gone to a minority. Now, um, and perhaps its most aggressive and controversial attempt to address the issue, the league will present a pair of resolutions this coming Tuesday during the owners' meet virtual meeting that it hopes will level the playing field. And uh, they had – everything here is done through the NFL network now. I notice how the NFL network is funneling everything. So we might get that for the owners' meetings. But I digress. Uh Here's the ideas. The first will remove the longstanding anti-tampering barrier that permits clubs to block assistant coaches from interviewing for coordinator positions with other clubs, even though having coordinator experience is typically the final and most significant step in becoming a head coach. The other way to incentivize the hiring of minorities as head coaches or primarily fo primary football executives by rewarding teams with improved draft slots multiple sources told NFL.com. The sources spoke on the condition of anonymity because of the sensitive nature of the topic. The league declined to comment Friday on this specific agenda for Tuesday's meeting, but if the resolutions were to be voted in under the league policy on equal employment and workplace diversity, they would work as follows. One, if a team hires a minority head coach, that team in the draft preceding the head, the coach's second season, we move up six spots from where it's slotted to pick in the third round. A team would jump 10 spots under the same scenario for hiring a person of color as its primary football executive, a position more commonly known as general manager. If a team were to fill both positions with diverse candidates in the same year, that team could jump 16 spots, six for the coach, 10 for the general manager, and potentially move from the top of the third round to the middle of the second round. Another incentive, a team's fourth round pick would climb five spots in the draft preceding the coach's or GM's third year. If he still is with a team, that is considered significant because Steve Wilkes and Van Joseph, two of the four African-American head coaches hired since 2017, were fired after one and two seasons respectively. If passed, the changes would be a radical departure from current protocol league officials have been trying for years to implement programs and procedures that would increase advancement opportunities for minorities from adopting the Rooney Rule in 20, 2003 to increasing fellowship positions, to bringing in pro and college coaches for networking and empowerment summits, to working with clubs to allocate more entry-level positions to diverse candidates. In addition to the coaching hires, only two of the 32 general manager positions currently belongs to someone of color. Alarming statistics considering 70% of head coach hires during the past three years came from two pos positions, quarterback coach and offensive coordinator. 
Uh, the belief internally is the numbers can be reversed by removing some of the barriers that have hindered minority mobility, such as teams blocking assistance from interviewing for coordinator positions elsewhere. Many owners view coordinator experience as essential for five-time, first-time head coaches, but currently Eric Bieniemy in Kansas City and Byron Leftwich in Tampa Bay are the only minority coordinators on offense. Under the proposed resolutions, clubs will be prohibited from the end of regular season to March 1st from denying an assistant coach the opportunity to interview with a new team for a bona fide coordinator position on offense, defense, or special teams. Any dispute about the legitimacy of the position will be heard by the commissioner and his determination will be final, binding, and not subject to further review. If a minority assistant left to become a coordinator elsewhere, his former club will receive a fifth-round compensatory pick. And if a person of color leaves to become a head coach or general manager, his previous team would receive a third-round compensatory pick. One final provision, any team that hires a person of color as its quarterback's coach will receive a compensatory pick at the end of the fourth round if it retains that employee beyond one season. The provision is an attempt to get a more diverse pool of coaches working with quarterbacks since the trend of late is to hire head coaches with offensive experience. 24 of the past 33 hires have been from the offensive side of the ball, and it's considered even more beneficial to have work with quarterbacks. Currently, there are only two African-American quarterback coaches in Pep Hamilton of the Chargers and Marcus Brady of the Colts. The league office is also looking at further enhancing the Rooney rule by doubling the number of minority candidates, a team must interview for head coaching position vacancies. It's also expected to apply the rule to coordinator positions for the first time. Steelers owner Art Rooney, too, hinted at changes in January during an interview with the NFL Network Steve Weish, and he said, I think we are where we are right now it is not where we want to be. It's not where we need to be. We need to take a step back, look at what's happening with our hiring process, the first thing we do as part of our diversity committee is really review this past season's hiring cycle and make sure we understand what went on and talk to the people involved on both the owner's side, and manager's side, as well as the people that were interviewed. Okay. And he said, the thing, the, thing, the thing I think we have to look at is back when the Rooney rules passed and put into effect in 2003, there was a period there where we did see an increase in minority hiring at the head coaching position. And I think over a period of time, there were 10 or 12 minority coaches hired. Since then, that trend seems to have reversed itself, particularly in the last few years, like since Trump was elected. Uh, we need to study what's going on and understand better what's going on and really decide how we improve the situation. Now, I, that was Jim Trotter's piece, but I threw in that Trump, Trump comment in the end. And then we had uh, uh, two of our Zenny 62 vloggers weigh in. The man you see right here is uh, Vinny Laspinoso. And I'm just going to take a quick uh, little s snippet of what Vinny said uh, earlier today and his comments on, on this whole, whole matter uh, in his post entitled NFL Proposing Radical Change to Rooney Rule. Here's Vinny. I think we really, really need to address this issue because it is a big problem, and the NFL knows this. No, I don't think the NFL is racist or anything. I think it's very, very ignorant to say that they're racist for hiring these people. No, no, no. They're hiring these people. No, no. The NFL knows that it needs to have this. They need to open these opportunities for people to make sure it doesn't look like only the white people can have it. And I agree where they're coming from. Now, do I think it's going to come from this? No, I think they're going to do something else. I don't think it's going to work for a third-round pick or any picks at all. Maybe it's a I can see a compensatory. I can see an extra compensatory pick. That I could see. I could see an extra compensatory pick happening if you, in fact, hire one. I think that is a much more probable scenario than giving teams an option, giving teams to move up in the draft because of their pick considering there's a lot of scenarios, whereas a compensatory, that makes a lot more sense. And then here other news, uh, was uh, heard uh, last night. our other Zinni 62 uh, vlogger, and that's Joseph Armanduras, saying the Rooney rule, the Raiders trumped the Rooney rule by 23 years and uh, without necessarily playing what he said, but then why not? Let's just give a, a little bit of taste for it. And here's Joseph. Hey, everyone. This is Joseph. So I'm here to give my perspective of the uh, NFL incentivizing the Rooney Rule. So, 
back in 2003, the NFL implemented the Rooney Rule that would allow for uh, teams or implement or suggest teams to give an opportunity for minorities to be interviewed for head coaching positions, general manager positions, and administrative roles in the NFL and the league as a whole. Now, I guess the NFL wanted to make more news for itself, but uh, the suggestion that you are going to incentivize the rule without getting into details, and if you saw earlier our Vinny 62 vlogger, uh, Vinny kind of broke it down for you. But I'm here basically to ponder some questions for the audience is why would you have to incentivize the Rooney Rule? I don't think that that is something that speaks well of the NFL. Now I'm going to stop right there because I disagree. So let's talk about it. And, uh, and Joseph, how are you doing? And uh, welcome. Good. Good. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so finish your thought. Why is there a problem in incentivizing? Well, because, it, well, not that so much that they're giving incentives, but they shouldn't have to give incentives. Because what does that tell you? Is that there's still a racial prejudice in the NFL, and now you can reward those same teams that have, in my belief, those same racial prejudices and give them incentives because they're going to hire somebody that they don't want to hire? I mean, I, there's two ways to look at it. I agree 100% that this needs to be implemented and they should waive the tampering rule, but I don't think this should be incentivized because they should be doing it already. You're rewarding somebody to do something they should be doing already. In other words, if I give an award to a father because he's taking care of his kids, that's what he's supposed to do, right? So that's how I look at it. Now, the incentives I don't like because we're not addressing the issue. Why aren't you hiring the head coaches? But now these people who have no interest in changing their mindset or the mentality are, I think, potentially may interview, potentially may hire minorities just because they want an upper hand. They want that compensatory pick or something else. And that's why I didn't like the idea of incentivizing. I think the opposite should happen. I think the teams that don't um, bring in minority candidates or do not hire candidates that are well qualified be penalized incentivize the fact that you will not be penalized if these opportunities are not given to potential minority candidates okay where i disagree is that i like the idea because what you're talking about essentially is a, a variation on what they came up with but i like the idea because we're talking about a group of people who have a great deal of money. Um, I've been in the room not only as a media personality, but also as a presenter of Super Bowl bid. And you're in a room where you've got people who were past uh, secretaries of state, uh, past advisors of government, of presidents and governors, current advisors of presidents and governors, you have a lot of people who are very powerful, white and male by and large, and they, are, they have an idea, unfortunately, some, I'm not going to say who, but some have an idea that because of their position, they are in a sense, in a position where they have to figure out how to help someone who's, you know, uh, who's black, but because they are in that position where they are patrician, if they bring in somebody, it's be, it's from the lens of, well, gee, I need to hire a percentage, okay, or I need to hire a person, as opposed to, hey, this person really is better than somebody else. And that's only part of the problem in the entire power structure. The other problem is the media itself. It's also white male. It wants access. It's been ran that way for some time. And you haven't had a black male media effort, a black media effort that was credentialed for the NFL that had more 
than one contributor that went to the owners' meetings that covered the games and everything else, that had television shows, that attracted advertiser money, and so on. And it's not that that effort couldn't be built. It could, but it hasn't been. And so what has been in its place is a white media where, where there has been a person's who are not white and male, if they're white and female, like I got after Ann Killian of the Samson Chronicle years ago on Twitter because she listed of the possible NFL coaching candidates on this particular year, she listed all white. She didn't mention anyone black. And I said, hey, look, you would not hesitate and you have not hesitated to point out where women were not mentioned for positions in sports. But when it comes to blacks and particularly black men, you're silent. And of course she didn't address what I said. So my point is little by little, you have people who are silent about this. I can name one person in media, not black, who hasn't been silent about, and that was Michael Silver. And he advocated for Hugh Jackson who got hired by the Browns. You know, we know what happened there unfortunately, but. The point is that Mike lobbied consistently for him and has been a consistent voice. But it's a problem overall, not just with the coaches, but also you have a number of black quarterbacks out there. Like I mentioned Cam Newton and DeAndre Francois, who are both free agents. But last year, Tyree Jackson played in the senior ball, was brought in the last quarter, scored two quick touchdowns as they were fawning over Drew Locke and uh, Daniel Jones and scored two quick touchdowns and was the top performer, even caused the Twitter mentions about the senior bowl to go off the charts. And yet he wasn't drafted. People made a lot about Steve Smith correcting him about a throw that he made uh, during the combine, but he's six, seven, has a rocket arm, no trouble at all you know, no criminal record or anything like that. I think it was picked up on a scout team, but that, and then he was played in the XFL. Uh, and what does Steve Smith say about him? If you don't, if you want to address that to the audience. Uh, Steve Smith was basically saying to him that you shouldn't, that he shouldn't have, uh, he shouldn't have gunned the, his pass so hard. Basically. He was just giving him but some. See, that's interesting. But see, that's interesting. That's what got highlighted of all the things that could be highlighted they take that particular statement and blow that up. Right. Well, that wasn't the only thing that the network did. And I point this out to Daniel Jeremiah at last year's NFL draft in Nashville because Daniel was saying, well, he can't throw short passes. And as Daniel was saying this during the senior bowl, one moment before he threw, before Tyree Jackson threw an eight yard pass for a touchdown, Daniel said this. And I just, just, instinctively turned on my vlog and I said, I'm going to track this. And I did. And so I undercut Daniel making these comments or he's like, I got him quoted as saying that. And then all of a sudden, boom, we see this buggy whip short pass by Tyree Jackson to score a touchdown. That's a short pass. So under Daniel's commentary, that should never have happened, but it did. And I can go on and on and on. And so my point is there, if you take him, if you take, other quarterbacks like um, Virginia's quarterback uh, that was dra- that was should have really been drafted in the fourth round, but fell in the free agency and got picked up by the Rams. And other quarterbacks who are black, including most notably Cam Newton, it looks like there's almost a rationing. It's like we've got all these guys, the Cardell Jones, that are just out there. They're really talented, should be with an NFL team but they're not picked up. And so overall, what's happening is it's like, it's dampening. It's also happening on a societal level. You have, of all groups, the one group that has the highest number of college educated persons today are African Americans with the highest unemployment rate. In other words, you have a lot of talented black folks credentialed with college degrees, but they're not getting hired. They're either out of the workforce or they're not getting positions commensurate with their experience or knowledge. And so it's not just so all throughout society, this is a problem. And so that's why 
I, I favor at the NFL level with what we're talking about doing this. I also don't like that there are media outlets like the league that don't specifically say, hey, look, you know what? This is a black problem. It's not a minority problem. It is a black problem because there are a number of people in the league who are light skinned and white Latino who have high positions in the league. And even on like the NFL network, um, as correspondence as I speak, but they're not seen that way. Okay. And there are other examples. Look at Ron Rivera, for example. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. There are other examples. So, but when it comes to someone who has my pigmentation, there's always, well, if I may, to put an even, yeah, yeah. even finer point on it, a survey that was released in 2015 discovered that, this is a scientific survey, discovered that if you were gay, black, and male, your average income was higher than if you were straight, black, and male. Now, you can only get to that position in society. Think about it. How does a society create that kind of outcome? It does so because it fears black men to begin with. And then your office environments where somebody might think, well, gee, you're going to be trying to date this person or maybe you did this. or, And then they're likely to mistake something that you did. And so that's the only way in society you come out with a dynamic like that, which is untenable. This hurts Men who have to, who are fathers of kids, which needs we need resources to live and raise them. Um, the other dynamic I should point out is that an interracial family, actually, almost regardless of combination, makes more money than all other combinations, save for those who are white. Interestingly, okay. So my point is, if you start, these disparities should not be. And yet they are today. That's why I was getting after the mayor of Oakland about not having hired a black police chief since uh, in her tenure. And we hadn't had a black police chief in Oakland since 2011. And we're about almost halfway through the first decade of the, the first year of the third decade of the 21st century. That's ridiculous. So at some point we have to, raise the alarm and say, okay, this is what we need to do now. That's all I'm saying. Your thoughts. So I have, yes, I have two thoughts and I'll finish my thoughts and see what your thoughts are. Get your opinion. So as you were speaking, there's, there's many thoughts that have crossed my mind, but one in particular was the reference to Ron Rivera. So this is what I, I was thinking as you were mentioning that I do believe that that's where the prejudice lie, because you were talking about a lighter skin minority, right? So I think everything has to do with color. And I think, oh, well, let's give this token minority happens to be of Latin descent. He's mm-hmm. not as dark. You know, he's a different shade, but not see. But I, that's an issue because that happens with Latinos as well. But in this particular case, I 100 percent agree with you, because here's the NFL's mindset or some of the NFL mindset. Well, Mm-hmm. We have to find yeah. higher minority. Yeah, it's, 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 so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so let me finish. It's, uh, we have to hire minority, but you know what? We don't like hiring black coaches. Um, let's, let's get this guy right here. He's not, you know, I think that there is, a, a, I think that happens quite a bit. The second thought I had to do with, with regards to incentives, bringing it back to that, was one of the reasons why I think personally I don't like incentives is that, Let's. You did mention Van Joseph and a few other coaches, and also Hugh Jackson, right? In 2011, after one year, they were fired. So let's say the incentive was okay. We hire a black coach, we get those compensatory picks or whatever incentive it is, and then a year later, after we get what we want, we fire them. And I'm afraid that that's what's going to happen because that's why the incentive process for me personally doesn't work because I think there has to be a cultural shift in the NFL Here's rather the, than incentivizing. And, and I agree with you, but what I was thinking about is trying to give it back. What bothered me about the Trotter article is that he didn't mention Cliff Kingsbury. Cliff Kingsbury 
was barely a head coach anywhere. He was head coach at Texas Tech in college. Then he was brought into USC, not as a head coach, but as an offensive coordinator. And then he went from offensive coordinator USC, jumped to Arizona. All right. Now, as a person who's a fan of his game, okay, that doesn't mean I'm anything less. But the simple fact of the matter is, to I'm not going to ignore the fact that he represents the kind of institutional racism that's active out there. And it's, so he was given a chance, okay, went with, what did he finish with a record of uh, eight and eight? I think it wasn't a record. It wasn't eight. It was six and 10 or seven and nine, I believe it was. Arizona Cardinal record. I should know that mm -hmm. off the top. I'll get that uh, right now. But uh, You know, while you're looking at that, can I add something while you're looking that up? Sure. Uh-huh. So, and that's part of the, the problem I have with the incentivizing this, because one of the comments that was made by the NFL is that they're going to waive the tampering to hire minority coaches or assistant coaches. But what prohibited the NFL from hiring black coaches from black colleges that are brilliant? See, that's just another excuse or another way to not address the issue, because what prohibited any NFL team from hiring black head coaches that came out of the collegiate field? None, because they hire people like Kelly who was a flop in the NFL, Kingsbury, who didn't have a substantial record as an assistant in the NFL, but they pull him right out, out of college. Well, why couldn't they do that to black head coaches in, in college? Arizona's from the was college a ranks. five and ten record. Okay, only run five games. And so they they fired um they fired Steve Wilkes. Steve Wilkes, I think, had a one win and eleven, but he wasn't even get a, given a chance. And Cliff has five wins and that's it. But you said it, the reason why the NFL hasn't done that, because they're black colleges. It's for the same reason that the NFL had not drafted a quarterback from a black, from a historically black college since 2006. And that was the now late Tavares Jackson who died in a car crash about uh, three weeks ago now, two weeks ago. So... And no one said anything about it, okay? And right now, the people who need to yell the loudest are people who look like me. But what happens is that when we do talk about it, we get on Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook site. Mark Zuckerberg is white. Not our own blogs. We don't go to Blavity or anything, which is owned by Morgan DeBalm, who raised $10.6 I, I might add, to start her site. And we think we're you know, going to make change by writing something on Facebook that no one's going to see. And or you have organizations like, you know, outside where there are black athletes and athletes and not only just black athletes, but people. Doesn't matter if you're black, you could be uh, a billionaire white female who feels the same way. There's no one marshalling these powers to make change. And I say that because right now we're in a world that is really interracial. It's not. The racial divide really isn't what people think it is because all you have to do is look at the television and see something that I've seen and I see all the time that I never thought I'd see in my life. White women, black male, commercial, family with a kid. That's common. White male, black female, commercial, family with a kid. That's common. If the mix is normal. The mix is the thing. And maybe there are people who are on the fringes who are pissed off about it, but that is the norm today. And so because that's the norm and it's institutionalized to expect diversity, the NFL has to step up to the plate and reflect what is, is presented in other sports, like in particular uh, the NBA. And, and that's a reason, I might add, that I hold the NBA teams in terms of franchise value are coming up with the NFL. It's because also viewership. They get a more diverse viewership or as diverse, but maybe arguably better. Does. And then well, I, I, no, I 100% I agree with you. So I'm, it, it's just something that I think as we move forward, I think the NFL has to take a closer look at itself as opposed to trying to incentivize. To me, that I understand completely where you're coming from and the idea of, yes, incentivize because we need to pull – these minorities or these black coaches in for general manager positions and, and administrative uh, staff around the league. 100% agree. But 
if we pull back that layer, there's something deeply ingrained, right? And it has to do, as you mentioned, and as I mentioned in the past, institutional racism. Yeah. And we have to change that. And like, as you mentioned before, it could very well be, so goes the country, so goes the league. Who do we have running the country right now? Uh, someone who believes that there's good people on both sides. And we both agree that's not the case. Yeah, and th that's exactly the point, is that there really isn't, the, the simple fact you said that, both sides, there really aren't both sides. There were, there were some wackos that decided to go down to Charlottesville to riot, who I thought, to be honest with you, I thought, hey, maybe all these guys are dating each other because there are no women down there, all right? I'm just saying, all right? I'm just saying, because some of those guys act like that. And it's like, today, I wouldn't be surprised. Just saying. You don't find women marching with them, which means what? The women really aren't totally sympathized. There was like maybe a, one or two out of like a thousand. But then you have like Reno Raider says, we need more Chinese coaches too. But here's the thing. The reason why we have a clarion call for African-American coaches is because of the stereotype that if you're black, you should be a player. 70% of the NFL is black as players. It's not, if 70% if of the NFL were Asian players and there were no coaches, you would hear the same criticism, I would believe, okay? But you don't have that. And Reno Raider, you know that. So you just be, you're just trying to be a bit of a blank hole by putting that up. I'm just being honest, okay? Stick with the resolution of the problem. And don't try to jump over it in that way. It's We've had what we don't want is the continuation of what looks like a plantation mentality. That is the whole purpose here. It is to, to, to rid ourselves of that. Hey, John Acala, for once and for all. Hey, let's do this because it's getting to be almost two o'clock in the east here. Why don't we pick this up tomorrow as a part? Okay. All right. We'll be back, folks. Great. Con hey, Joseph, don't go anywhere, Joseph. Thanks. All right. Everybody. We will. We shall return. I, I keep trying to figure out my hands. Try to get all my hands in this 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 box here. You know, it's like ah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow or today, whichever place you are. Place. Yeah.